Videsar featured an article on John Eaton. John Eaton had exhibited at several galleries uh, all over North America, such as Gotham Gallery, New York, Robertson Galleries, Ottawa, Calgary, Galleries uh, in Calgary, John Peterson Gallery in Boston, Canada House Gallery in London, England, um, and the Gadotsi Gallery in Toronto. I have John Eaton with me today, and this is a very rare opportunity to listen to the painter himself talking about his work. Welcome, Mr. Eaton, and uh, one of my first questions is, I know that you have been painting for a very long time. Is it 60 years? Am I correct? I would think pretty close to 60 years. You paint as a, or draw as a youngster, and if you uh, get reward and pleasure out of it, you keep going, depending on what uh, pales in comparison. You, know? you went to the Steiner School? At uh, 17, 16 years old, but I was at the general, through the general public school system up until then. Mm -hmm. And your very first um, works were mostly sketches? I guess the originals were drawings. I didn't think of them as sketches. They were sort of complete in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first exhibits I had was at Robertson Gallery's, and that was all cat drawings. Mm -hmm. But some of them were three feet square, you know, they were considerable size. But uh, they were major in my mind, and drawings by other people's standards, perhaps you could say. Uh, later, uh, you have moved mostly to landscapes, nature. Yeah, nature. I, I see was, a lot. Yeah, figures and Fig figures in movement and uh, and figures with auras and this sort of thing in the earlier years. I'm I'm almost less anthroposophical or Steiner school in style now than I would have been considered earlier. But that all that earlier work had to do with the Steiner schools and doing eurythmy and dance and choreography and all of that. So dance inspired you in your painting? Oh, I think working with movement, all of these things assist somewhere, somehow along the line. You know, you never are aware of exactly what is more significant uh, than others. But uh, yes, dance helped. Dance. I do find that in your art, many of your paintings, the elements of nature are literally dancing with each other, fire and water and wind and earth. Yeah, all of the elements. I, I try to do, a, you know, I seem to want to do subjects that have a bit of a shock factor for uh, to catch the eye. And beyond, and beyond that, I, I don't honestly really know what, what they're about any more than I can feel when they're, when they're right or when they're not right, you know. And you, mm -hmm. you edit, but you try not to edit with, uh, with uh, commodification in mind, or, you know. Were you inspired by... Um people per se or also by experiences? I think in all the earlier years it was probably other artists, more artists and uh, you know the, the Michelangelo, the classical thing and Rodin, I mean I studied sculpture seriously in Florence but uh, you have your heroes when you're young and you outgrow them and you don't really know the reasons for outgrowing them and eventually you get your own style whether it's so visible to yourself, it's, it's visible to others, and uh, that kind of forms around you. I, I don't have any sort of target in mind with that. That, that just forms on its own. Mm -hmm. Of all the shapes that you have um, used in your art, is there a particular shape or form that you prefer? Well, it seems as though I do a lot of horses, and I've been referred to as a horse artist in Quebec here at times, and, and that is kind of a shot below the target, you know. I, I like the movement, the power. I use horses as an energy source, the same sort of thing that uh, that Goya might have a fleeting horse in the background of one of his paintings, which really isn't to say anything more than an action image. Uh, it's not the rider, it's not the horse, it's more the location in the painting. And I honestly don't know uh, any more than where a person sits something in the sky. You know, it's it's unkind of subconscious uh, editing of a nature that you, you, you go with. You know? um, in fact, I want the listeners to know that uh, when I arrived um, here at your property, 
you uh, showed up with a horse and the horse followed me around uh, in fact all the way to the door and you had to put a rope in <laughs> to stop the horse from coming into the house or on the porch anyhow yeah on the porch yeah um, the horse loves you very much you're very attached to animals to the horse well, he's he's the only horse I have, and uh, he's comfortable here. I've schooled him slowly over the years that he doesn't see me as an overly disciplining uh, person. So, uh, and I think without other horses, they adapt to people just like some dogs will go in groups if there aren't people around. But if he's the only dog, he stays right on your feet all the time. And you also have four cats. Three cats at present, but three or four. They're here in and out all the time. Oh yes. Yeah, that's uh, cats and coons on the back porch. I looked at your paintings, I visited your studio, and um, I noticed that one of the figures that comes um, often is a fox. Is there a particular reason, foxes or other animals? No, uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, I think uh, foxes... Uh, I don't know why I did them. I originally, years ago, did a series of paintings in Montreal because they were selling and I enjoyed doing them, but they sold to law firms and corporations in association with the Renard, you know, and the cleverness of the fox and the cleverness of the people. And uh, and it just seemed amongst all the works I was doing, the fox paintings uh, appealed to the legal corporations and so on that uh, they fancy themselves to be foxy. And so it was uh, suitable, but I, I, I can't say that uh, foxes are anywhere as near as significant in my mind as maybe a, a large workhorse. I'm not interested in riding horses, for example, not even owning one, but I like the enormity and the power of the symbolism. So, But no, animals just are in there simply because I always have them around me. I don't, uh, I don't really know uh, why an awful lot of things come into people's subject matter that they can't explain. What would you say that your main themes are? Jeez, can you give me a minute to think here? Uh, <laughs> my main themes are... Uh, I don't know. Darkness and light. I choose kind of allegorical subjects. I, uh, I honestly don't know. A lot of the works seem to be dark and people come and view them because they like my work or they know me through somebody who has a painting and they say they don't like all this dark work and they end up buying one of the darkest paintings I ever did. So the more you look at it, the more you see color and involvement. I don't know. I really can't answer the question other than that uh, you feel better when you do it, and what you've expressed is kind of hard to say, and that's why you're painting it instead of talking, I guess, you know. I did notice that you seem to favor darker tones, although you do have very bright colors in your paintings as well. Um, what is with the darker tones? What, what they, do, they, hmm. do you relate better to them? I think there's a mystery in the dark, just like you can't see at night, but it gets dark every night, and people seem to be phobic about darkness and light. I know that I've loaned a lot of paintings to homes for people to uh, palliative care and all of this kind of thing, and they always want colorful, joyful pictures. Now, that's not the ultimate in art criticism, but uh, uh, for me to do a painting all yellow isn't as rewarding as to do one in deeper tones why it has to go to black or dark, as some of them are. I don't know. They make people look at them. People can look at a lighter colored work and excuse it. They look at a dark one and they start to think. And that's what the paintings are about. The way people think and feel. The soul, maybe. You know. Some of your paintings um, really have um, a lot of sexuality in them. There's passion, there's sexuality, and others, they show motherhood. Uh, would you like to talk about both themes? Well, I can't comment about motherhood, but I think all people are full of sexuality, and certainly if you make a mention of it, or if it catches the eye, mm -hmm. it becomes uh, something people are very interested in, but uh, I'm no more interested in portraying sexuality than I am... Uh, the way people think about everything else as well, but I don't. I don't think they're sensuous. But I, uh, 
I, I, you know, I'm no Francis Bacon. I mean, he's a man who paints about sexuality. Uh, compared to Francis Bacon, I paint about furniture, you know. But uh, no, I have no intention of painting about sexuality. I don't do erotic art. I mean, I may have done maybe four or five paintings in my life that were directly related to uh, sexual subjects, and they were a little bit more of an illustration to myself other than something with deep meaning, you know. Um, you had a long career, and um, I noticed that your style changed from a, a certain time to a certain time. If you could divide it, how would you describe it? Well, I think we all change, you know, as we evolve, and uh, we lose the things that don't give us feedback. Uh, whether you're looking at your own painting for year after year after year or whatever it is, but uh, I think that after a while you tend to do the things that, that move you, and you never really know what makes you moved, you know, outside or in your thinking, you just you follow it and you go with it as long as it gives you uh, a lift to get it. I mean, when you get a painting right, you feel absolutely joyful for half a day or something at least, you know, and, uh, and that's basically what lures me along. Really not so much the subject matter, but whatever I do, if I get it the way it makes me feel good as a visual, that uh, that massages everything, you know? Mm -hmm. When you imagine a person, any person, what do you see? What part of the body? Oh, I guess the eyes and forehead, and I sort of think about their sexuality, I suppose, like most people do. Some would talk about it and some wouldn't, but uh, there's form. It's movement. I see movement. I see a tremendous amount of uh, potential ailments, sickness, disturbed uptightness. I mean, there's a lot of cliches that for describing people's posture, manner, and behavior, and I'm pretty, pretty alert to that. Mm -hmm. It's actually what sticks out in the person more than what's prominent in my mind. I, 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 I kind of get intrigued with whatever somebody else is exhibiting more than what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I've been looking around and um, I noticed that you have no spiritual, no religious, um, you know, um, icons or any anything. Um, are you an agnostic or are, do you have other forms of... Um well, I guess I would have to say I have other forms. I, I don't... I don't know why basically painting is important to me in a kind of a religious way. If you want to use those words, other people have other faiths and other interests, but uh, I know uh, all the different communities. I mean, I have a tremendous percentage of people that are far more religious than myself. Now, I don't understand their religion that well, but they enjoy my paintings. They seem to communicate with me on that level, but uh, no conventional religion would I be associated with. I mean, I don't believe God's in the sky, you know, but there's a tremendous energy in people that uh, is more than lightning hitting a mud puddle, you know, but something started it all. Mm -hmm. You seem to be uh, a bit secluded at this location. It was economically feasible. Forty, fifty years ago when I bought the farm here, it was uh, low digit, you know, roughly ten thousand dollars. It's worth three or four hundred thousand now probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time I got it, I didn't want to do anything but paint, and the mortgage was low, and uh, no overhead. You know, I mean, it was just what you do if you're dedicated, you find the right place to proceed, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's turned out to be a good investment, but it was never intended to be sold until I'm sold, you know. You started as an artist, as a painter in, in the 50s. Uh, I guess so. 50s, 60s. And now in, we are 2012. How did the world of art change? Well, the market changes, the world changes, and this just evolves as slowly as one evolves. You know, I, uh, I really can't say that the world of art doesn't change, but commodification, business, and value assessed, uh, you know, more than two people wanting the same painting for whether it's spiritual or because it's worth a lot of money at the bank, uh, they, they, they are interested, and in, in, in people who can't paint or don't paint, who aren't creative, 
collect things like this to give themselves meaning, you know? It's kind of like the Cadillac. No one can tell if there's an engine in it or not, but people want it on their driveway. So there's that whole world, but the art doesn't change from the standpoint of why it's done, but it's bought for all sorts of different reasons until the insurance becomes so high that the person who copies it is almost as valuable as the person who did the original. You told me that some of your um, um, role models um, in, in arts were um, Goya, Rodin, sure. Michelangelo. Those uh, classical, the yeah, classical. classical style, yeah. Uh, what about the contemporary ones? Oh, gee, I really don't know. I think Francis Bacon, for instance, I, I, his subject matter wouldn't be my choice. I'm not gay. I'm not interested in all that so much, but I think he paints the human condition in a far greater way than Picasso, for example. I mean, he portrays what it is to be alive, whether it's somebody waiting in an office or somebody in bed. That whole portrayal and technique of his is, is pretty extraordinary. And some people feel the same way about Salvador Dali, on the other hand. To me, it's more of a technical skill than it is a great mind. I mean, I think the poetry in his work is weak compared to the technique, you know? Mm -hmm. So it just whatever appeals, but in my case, uh, I can't think off the top of my head who'd be a favorite artist at this point. I like Van Gogh, you know, I, I still like the uh, the extremism of his technique and the way he thought, but uh, gee, I can't off the top, maybe if we talk a little longer I'll think of someone that sticks out in my mind, but uh, oh gee, I don't know, I honestly don't know. You paint on large canvases using brushes, using um, your hand. Using mostly bare hands. Mostly bare hands? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I paint backgrounds and I get them started with brushes just to move the paint around. Mm -hmm. But basically it's, it's paint sticks that I buy in New York. And they're big, large paint sticks, the, the size of a, a, a container of grease mm -hmm. for a grease gun. and. Uh, and I smear them around. I, I, I start a painting without sketches. I sort of jump in the deep end of the pool and work it out. And if it doesn't work out, you quit or you wash it off and start again. But uh, there's no sketching or no fiddling around. So it's great masses of a paint dumped on and managed straight in one sitting of maybe three hours. I haven't seen too, too many uh, small canvases. They are mostly large canvases. Well, I have them. You have them. Not smaller than 10 inches. I okay. mean, nothing that small, but uh, a foot by two feet is the smallest I work. And mm -hmm. uh, that's basically the same size as works on paper. I didn't show you any works on paper. And they're all, you know, your average half a newspaper size or smaller. You told me that you lived in Italy for three years and yeah. you studied sculpture. Yeah, marble sculpting at the Porta Romana School and also the Academia de Belle Arte, the two of them, the two different ones at different times. And then I stopped being a student and worked with one of the teachers just to prepare marble as slabs, more or less as a stone worker, because you learn more about the technique. I didn't want to learn about writing, you know, making letters, the whole alphabet. I mean, that's handy if you're making gravestones, but it really is of no value to to myself as a as uh, doing forms how did the work with marble help you in painting it didn't, it didn't. no it's the work in painting that helps you with marble mm -hmm. it's really yeah, the other yeah. way around a classical drawing and how you have that so that it's strong enough to to be michelangelo-esque or rodin-esque really carry itself and that's movement really more than static you know but no, the, the sculpting didn't help anything. It's just a lot of physical work. It's very interesting and it's very profound to have a sculpting that's three or four feet square that are upwards to three or four feet standing. But uh, no, I mean, when you're unknown, you can sell a piece of marble for more than you can sell a work of art. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, what are you going to live on? I'm not going to drive a school bus and I don't have the education to do anything. But what I do well or well not, who knows, you know? Um, you mentioned the economic times that are hard for artists. How do you find the economic times right now? 
Well, they're very slow now, but I've done well enough in the past that I'm not in trouble, but uh, it's human nature, you know, if there isn't any coming in, you don't want to see any go out, and you kind of stick with that, whether it's a million dollars or, or 200, but uh, I've done well enough in the past that I'm fine, and there are people still interested, you have to work at it more, and uh, people are skeptical and nervous, but... Uh, I've sold enough in the past that at times like this, people know if you invest in some artists, it's better than putting money in the bank at this stage. So you, you, you promote yourself from that standpoint to people who do collect. Your work is owned by private collectors, but also by institutions. Bank of Canada, you told me. They oh, yes, that was, that was years ago, but... Uh, Gosh, I can't even memorize, uh, or I can't even think of the corporations. Uh, La Presse in Montreal, when I used to exhibit in Montreal, Roger, oh, gee, I don't remember what his name was. He bought a lot of work for La Presse. And um, I can't, I, I don't know what companies there were, but there's a, I have in the studio a list of these corporations and so on. A Reader's Digest in America, who would have known, has a tremendous art collection. I know they have a lot of work of mine. But I don't even know at this point which paintings they have. I haven't kept track of that. I think the galleries know, and then when you sell privately and leave the galleries, they won't give you that list, you see. Mm -hmm. You could probably get it with a lawyer, mm -hmm. but that makes you a difficult personality, you know. I noticed that your painting mostly uh, represents life. Yeah, sure, it should. Mm -hmm. That's what communicates. That's what you have in common with other people, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about death? Well, <laughs> kind of look forward to it sometimes. I don't know how I feel about death. I think that it's an interesting subject matter, and the more you get up in years, it seems you're more concerned about what you kill, and you know, and what you take care of, and so on and so forth. So that's an interesting feeling, but uh, I don't think about death much, other than the fact that uh, I don't intend to sort of hang on in a home and hopefully a supported euthanasia will be a, a, a handy thing when, when I have to consider it. But uh, I live alone, so I have to sort of keep myself in good form. I, I, I take care of myself, with the exception of the odd drink, but uh, I wouldn't know what to say about how you think about death. I think it'd be a, a great relief some days, you know, and I, I mean, it's kind of a humor-based statement, but... Uh, no, I live well. I live well. I live well by many people's standards, so I, uh, I just am careful not to half kill myself. But other than that, it's all fine. Next life, would you like to be a painter again? Oh, geez, you never know. You, you enjoy what you are to the best you can. Uh, I wouldn't, if, I, if my life has been good as this, fine. I had a lot of learning problems when I was young. So there was a lot of stress and pressure with, uh, with autism, not autism, but with uh, dyslexia and stuff like that. So I could, I could do without that, but I'm not certain that all of that anguish and alienation and you know, vomiting out of society by youth and people, that, that makes you interesting. So, you know, you've got to have all of that. I mean, I think most kids that have had a tough time write better, paint better, they're a little more out on the edge, they're a little more uh, rejected by society, so that their, their subject matter is a little more pertinent. So I don't know whether I'd want to do it all over again, but uh, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what I wouldn't mind having been. Somebody said something on the radio the other day I thought it'd be kind of an interesting life, but it's not something you choose. It's not something you choose. I'd like to be an analyst, a psychiatrist. You know, I I, um, I read people pretty quickly, pretty well. So if I can, if I could do something like that, I'm sure it would be rewarding. I don't need an object as much as I just need the the pleasure of communicating. Do you see a new phase coming in your painting? You never see it coming. You just have that feeling. There's you you know there's something more you want to get, but I don't know really what it is. But uh, I don't have a. A, a market concept in front of me that uh, I want to sort of pursue. It's the way you do things that make uh, make them communicate, not what you do, you know. 
And it's the same with keeping dance alive. Opera singers have to keep it going with the same old songs, you know. So it's really what you're projecting into these things, not the object themselves or the medium. John Aiden, thank you very much for um, the interview. And do you have a few words for our listeners or, and for those young artists who are trying to make it in a world of art? Uh, it's it's so hard to talk to a younger artist because they're so full of their own anguishes. And, uh, you know, they've got to hang in there, but know that uh, even when they think things are picking up... Uh, you constantly keep yourself in a state that is never very rewarding for any length of time. So that's part of the part of the deal. Mm -hmm. And the mindset is very subversive. So no matter where you are and what you are or who you're with or what, not at all eventually gets turned upside down and that's part of the gift. It doesn't make for conventional living, but it is part of the gift to constantly evolve to renew yourself. But it's just it's erosion and uh and growth, and it is very subversive, but it's also, because of that standpoint, surprising and tremendously pleasurable. But, uh, you know, it's uh, if you cut corners, you don't get any further ahead. You just have to fill in that corner eventually, you know. So, away you go. Thank you very much again, and uh, you listen to John Eaton. His website is johneaton.ca, and his phone number is... 819-456-2786. Thank you very much again for being in my show. You're most welcome. All the best to all of you.